Dag sê en hartelijk welkom by Robinson Regheid hier op Litnet. Die Reservebank het bereken dat beurtkracht elektriciteit in die vorige boekjaar die landse economie met minstens 3,2 percentasiepunte laat krimp het. En dit kan volgende jaar stijg tot meer as 5%. Na aanvankelijke traagheid aan die kant van die regering om hernieuwbare energie op groot skaal op te wek, is een hevige strijd aangepak om so vinnig as moendlik by komende kracht te genereer om die economie een hulpstoot te geën. Intussen word Zuid-Afrika gebind dier internationale ooreenkomste om sy koolstofbesoedeling van die atmosfeer weens sy groot steenkoolkrachtstaties te verminder. Ons gast is Dr. Karen Saric, sy is die projectbestuurder van hernieuwbare energie en van skoon fossiel energie van die entiteit Sanedi. Dit is die Zuid-Afrikaanse Nationale Energieontwikkelingsinstituut. Welcome Dr. First of all, tell us more about Sanedi. Morning, Greg, yes. Sanedi is the South African National Energy Development Institute. Uh, essentially, we uh, report directly to the Ministry of Energy, Minerals and Energy Resources, and we inform policy. So we do a lot of work in the research and development and innovation space, where we gather data and information which we use to inform policy. We also implement a lot of the energy efficiency initiatives for the country. Um, and it is a very broad mandate that really focuses on how do we deal with um, the way that energy moves in the country, what it's required, how do we model it, what resources do we have, and so forth. So it, it's quite a busy um, institute that we have going here with a lot of different components to it. In the past week, we've had less load shedding. Do you think we're winning this battle? Um, yes, look, of course, plans are on the way for recovery, and I'm seeing that there are predictions that we should have a lot less load shedding by the end of the year. Um, obviously, at the moment, with the maintenance that's being done, um, the scheduled maintenance and so forth, we are seeing a bit more stability um, and a bit less load shedding, and we're also seeing a bit more intermittent load shedding, so it's not constant. We're having it at certain times of day now. now. So it is pointing to a more stable um scenario moving forward and they're predicting within another year that the load shedding will stabilize and, and hopefully not be necessary. What is the shortfall that we have at the moment? So um, this is actually a common misconception. Um, the amount of megawatts or actually gigawatts that we are short from day to day is proportionate to the stage of load shedding that we're at. So for example if we need 30 gigawatts but we only have 26 available, then we would be in stage four of load shedding. So it's those four gigawatts deficit that is that, that dictates the stage of load shedding that we're at. Um, so essentially at the moment, our load is predicted around, I read an article this morning actually that said our load is predicted in winter at around 35 gigawatts, so 35,000 megawatts. Um, but we only have about 28 available from our conventional fleet at the moment. So they're topping it up with our peakers and our open cycle gas turbines. Also our pump storage. Um, so of course at night they charge that up and then they can use it during the day. And that's also helping to alleviate load shedding during the day. That shortfall must be made up by renewable energy such as wind and solar. Give us a breakdown of how much in each. Um, renewable energy, as you're aware, is already coming into the South African energy or electricity mix um, quite quite well. We've got about 6.8 gigawatts that is online at the moment, so already producing. But that means that the, you get the full 6.8 when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing at the same time, um, which isn't always the case. So what we find is that there's normally around two, two and a half gigawatts available at any given time from the renewable stream. There's over nine gigawatts already awarded, if I can put it that way. So under the, the, the missing amount between the 6.8 and the nine is under construction. We will need to put a lot more renewables under construction in order to be able to fill those gaps. But um, if we how didn't- How much more? How much more? Well, if, if we didn't have the um, renewables that are online at the moment, we'd be another two stages of load shedding higher. So ideally, you need um, about three times the amount of renewable build for your deficit. So if, again, let's use the example of four. So if we're on stage four load shedding, and so therefore we are four gigawatts short, we need to build 12 gigawatts of renewables to fill that gap. 
So this is why um, when South Africa developed the Integrated Resource Plan, IRP 2019, you see uh, there's a much more diverse energy mix in there. We normally were mainly on a coal-fired power station. We were getting, our coal-fired power stations were supplying over 80% of our electricity. In the new mix, what we're seeing is that um, they're supplying significantly less with a larger energy mix coming in from other energy resources, such as renewables. And those renewables are delivered basically um, by the private sector, isn't it? Yes, they are produced by renewable energy independent power producers. So the REI and then PPP <laughs> program, um, they are producing and selling to the grid. The shortfall that we have at the moment will be delivered by the private sector in particular, isn't that so? Yes, so we have the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Procurement Program. Sounds like a mouthful. Everybody just calls it the REI4P. And essentially, um, there's been different what they call bidding windows um, that have taken place that have um, allowed us to procure from the private sector electricity that is then being put onto the grid. And can you give us an indication of how much solar power as opposed to wind power and then the traditional power that we get from the coal stations? So essentially, um, we have we have a bit more wind than solar that's been allocated already to the grid. So, um, But if we look at the upcoming amounts, so just to give you an idea, and these are rough numbers, but 14 gigawatts of wind and 9 gigawatts of solar are expected to be coming into the next procurements. Um, and then, of course, we do have our coal-fired fleet. As you're aware, some of the coal-fired power stations are becoming a little bit old-timers. They are going to need to retire. So several of them are retiring. They're becoming, and the reason for that is, firstly, they're becoming, they're very energy inefficient in terms of the electricity they can produce per kilogram of coal that's being combusted there. And they're becoming expensive to maintain. So um, they do need retirement. Um, we have our two new uh, coal-fired power stations that um, once they're functioning optimally will be more energy efficient and will have lower emissions so be more environmentally friendly. Do you have any indication of how much private people are delivering at the moment and is it making any difference in the global picture that we have of the country's needs? So at the moment the private uh, sector, um, this is now you're talking about for um, uh, well, industry, commercial, and and shopping centers that are putting PV up, but then also residents that are putting PV on the roof. Now, the residents so, in particular, if you can tell, yes. do you have any way of actually measuring that, of how much they already produce, even if it's just for themselves and taking them out of the picture in terms of the national need? Yes, so there, there are estimates around this. Um, look, not everybody's um, telling government when they install PV. <laughs> So um, it's not really uh, something that we have a, a very specific number for, but there is quite a significant amount of um, PV going in, particularly at the moment with the power constraints that we're experiencing and the load shedding. So um, what is happening is that they cannot sell to the grid, but we are removing load from the grid. So the grid is not having to supply to those people so much. It depends on what kind of systems they're putting in as well. So if, for example, at home, you're considering putting in a PV system, do you put in just the panels so that you have electricity during the daylight hours? Or do you put in some sort of battery storage backup? And if you do, what kind of batteries and how long do they last before you then have to switch back to grid electricity? So um, it's all very much a case of um, energy balance, if I can put it that way, where you re still rely on the grid at certain times, but not all the time, which means the grid needs to be available for you regardless. I just read uh, an article myself uh, today that batteries might be the answer in the short term uh, to actually make up for that gap that we have. Do you agree? So this is definitely something that's being considered. Um, they, they call it the storage option, which... Um, covers the batteries as well. So yes, we have actually at Sanedi, and this is one of, an example of one of the types of studies that we do in the past, we did a study that looked at what happens if we put down batteries at what we call grid scale, so that would be able to supply quite a large number of households at any given time. How would that help? And what we found is that it would actually um, sometimes defer upgrades 
and maintenance in an area where you can't necessarily get in there or don't have the budget to get in there straight away. So if you put in batteries, it would carry you through until you are ready to expand grid in that space. So yes, it has a short-term potential, but batteries, as we all know, are not an inexpensive technology, although the prices will most likely start to come down as the technology advances and, um, of course, the uptake increases. Is renewable energy economically feasible? Well, most consumers won't agree with this. We still have relatively inexpensive coal-fired electricity. Um, but what is happening is that the PV and wind is starting to come on par with that. In the beginning, it was quite expensive. So if we go back, say, a decade or 15 years, it was, it was rather expensive to be plugging renewables into the grid. But it has now become almost comparable with what we can produce coal-fired electricity at. What is the amount of foreign investment that is flowing into the country, into the renewables? In the renewable space, um, if you look in the news and so forth, you will see that it's it's hundreds of billions that are coming into the country in terms of investment. Um, but we must remember we're investing in infrastructure, um, and that has it, it has a full value chain attached to it. So some of that people don't make investments in this; they're expecting a return on investment. So yes, we can say there's this much coming in, but we can also say that there has to be a return on that investment going out. Um, and then what we need to be doing, and, and it is being done by a number of, of bodies, and I believe the CSIR is one of the foremost in this, is looking at modeling what is the full value chain that we're getting out of this investment. Um, for example, our skills development, jobs, infrastructure development, um, all of the knock-on industries that have to feed into this development. So, for example, if you're putting up a solar farm in the Northern Cape and it's not, uh, it, it creates almost an economic hub in that area where you see lots of other industries growing because the solar farm is there. And I feel that those need to be into answering the kind of question that you're asking as well, because the investment is not necessarily just for the electricity production. It has a full value chain that it impacts on, you know, from the bus that has to drive there and uh, to the lady that's making lunch on the site, you know, it's, it's a full value chain. <laughs> I've read some reports saying that even if more power is generated, it cannot necessarily be connected to the network. Is that true? Uh, in some cases, yes, it is true. It depends on where the electricity grid is. Also, remember, we have an aging grid. It's more than 40 years old in most parts of the country. Um, so we have five main lines that, that stretch throughout the country into which all the networks um, of the grid connect. So uh, it depends on where you are putting the independent power producer or even, for example, an ESCOM build um, and where you are planning to connect it. Also, the capacity of those lines that you're planning to connect it to, can they handle the capacity that you're plugging in? So a lot of times we need an infrastructure um, upgrade um, in order to be able to accommodate the additional electricity that's going to plug into the grid. Okay, let's move on to your other responsibility, and that is, of course, to ensure that we have uh, we're helping in the fight against global warming. What exactly is the position at the moment? How serious is it? South Africa has signed into several international commitments to reduce emissions. Um, obviously, the country as a whole, we need to look at what are our carbon emissions versus our economic growth and the predicted growth over the future. So uh, at Sanedi, we've actually put in, in place, and in, in fact, we've just launched the second phase of what we call the Cleaner Fossil Fuels Roadmap, which really looks at how do we clean up our fossil fuel value chain in terms of emissions. So it's different types of technologies, um, the economics behind implementing those technologies and the skills required. Um, and essentially what it does is it covers um, what is out there, what works for South Africa, what should we be doing in South Africa and what do we need to accomplish that? Not only in terms of finances, but also in terms of capacity and skills. Um, if we have electrical cars or more electrical cars on the road, that will probably help a great deal. What is your projections in terms of that? 
Electrical cars run on electricity, which needs to come from somewhere. <laughs> so you need to be charging those electrical cars. Um, as soon as there are more electrical cars on the road, of course, you do see emissions dropping in terms of vehicular emissions. Um, but you need to be charging them up. So if you're charging them up and having to work your coal-fired power stations harder to give you that electricity, it sort of zeroes out your emissions. However, if you are charging them with renewable energy sources, um, then it starts to become a much different picture because then you start seeing that you've almost got green transport going or green vehicular transport going on the roads because you're charging with um, a solar or a renewable energy source. Are we making progress to meet our international obligations? Um, at the moment, we are electricity constrained. That's why we're having the load shedding. So we, we need to balance out our energy security against our emissions commitments. Um, now, for the average person in the street, they would rather have the light switch on when they flick a switch than think that I to save, you know, some carbon dioxide emissions. So it then it, you then have to balance it out against providing energy security to um, emission savings. And that's why at Sunedi we do studies like, for example, the Kina Fossil Fuel Roadmap. Even, for example, one of our previous studies looked at hybridizing the renewable and fossil fuel energy or electricity value chains. And, and how does that then impact on the environmental requirements that we have? So there's a shift towards it. But in South Africa, we need to consider also our econ economy as well as our energy security. So whatever we do needs to essentially talk to all three of those things. We need to be energy secure, we need to be growing our economy, but we need to be reducing emissions. And, and how do you do that? How do you balance that out? And that is still obviously something that's almost a, a fluid dynamic space because it's changing the whole time. Well, I've heard the term clean coal. Isn't that a bit of a contradiction? How is it possible to have <laughs> clean coal? Many people feel that clean coal, yes, is a bit of an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's it's um, essentially we 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 look at when we talk about clean coal we, we we look at you know how do we reduce the environmental impact of for example burning one kilogram of coal so if we burn one kilogram of coal in a dirty manner um, what are the emissions and if we take that same kilogram of coal and we burn it in a clean manner what are the emissions and it can't you can't just look at um, you know I'm burning coal and comes the smoke. You have to look at the whole value chain, the mining, the burning or the combustion, and then the post-combustion processes. And how do we clean up all of that? And, and our roadmap actually outlines along this value chain exactly that those kind of um, clean interventions that can take place in our coal-fired electricity uh, value chain. Do you think we are actually in line with international expectations uh, about our situation? I believe we're stri striving to be in line with the international expectations, yes. Um, I believe there are a lot of policies and um, um, implementations underway that are driving towards that. Uh, but if you look globally, just about no countries are on par to deliver what they need to deliver according to some of the agreements. Um, and it's really, if you look down to the core of it, and I was reading a, an article again earlier today about it saying, um, that the UK is reducing their spend on climate mitigation or climate change mitigation measures. And it all boils down to uh, eco economics and having the finances available. It costs money to clean up your emissions act. Um, and so do you have that money available and is it expendable on, on that for your country? So no. I don't think we should be sinking out South Africa for this. I think it's a global issue that needs to be considered. Um, globally, not, um, you know, one of the, we are, we are a high emitter, but we are not one of the top emitters. And I think we are moving in the right direction to reduce our emissions. On a personal level, you work with people from ESCOM. You get the sense that um, the morale is very low. I work closely with the ESCOM research and development teams. So they're the guys that are actually researching things like our clean coal technologies, our emissions reductions, 
bringing in other energy sources such as the renewable energies and how do they then synchronize those on the grid. So I'm really in the technical space. Um, I also am not a politician and I don't really know, understand the political space very much. So I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> But certainly you know more than what I do or any other. What I can tell you, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah what, I, what I can tell you is that I know that the ESCOM um, staff that I work with, so in the R&D space, as well as the engineers on the power plants, are extremely competent people. Extremely competent. And I think they get a bit, a bit of a raw deal in the media, actually, because they are doing absolutely everything that they can to keep us energy secure and keep the lights on in the country. So... I can tell you that there is an absolute impetus and um, drive towards building ESCOM into what it needs to be to deliver what's required by the country from the people that I work with at ESCOM. Do you enjoy your job? Absolutely. I love my job. Every day is a bit different. Today I get to talk to you. Um, sometimes I'm out in the field climbing on the roof, working on a solar panel, and sometimes I am, you know, giving a seminar or a training. So every day is different. I really enjoy the multifaceted um, dynamics of my job. It's really impressive. Also, I was speaking with a colleague this morning, and we were both agreeing that you never know what each day is going to drop on you, because there's always a new and exciting challenge in the energy space. What is there that's still that you want to achieve personally? My big drive is actually to get knowledge out there to, to everyone. So it doesn't necessarily, I always say, you know, you, you never have all the information. So people, you know, might have a small piece of information, they get upset. Most decisions are made on emotional side, but to get as much information out there as possible around how energy works, how you can become more energy efficient and the different types of energy that you have available to you. So I actually really enjoy giving seminars and trainings around different technologies, um, different things that you can do to make a difference in the country and, and in the world, of course, globally, uh, in terms of making sure that you have electricity and energy when you need it, but that you're using it efficiently, you're not wasting. And that goes for all resources. I mean, if you look at anything, we have to have water, we have to have energy to be able to survive. All of our resources we should be using in a responsible manner and in an efficient manner. And efficiency just means you use less of the resource to achieve the same outcome that you need. So for example, if you're sitting in the room and you walk out of the room, you don't need the lights on because you're not in the room anymore. So you can switch the lights off. So it's really just a matter of, I enjoy uh, communicating with people and sharing the knowledge that we have in the space. Doctor, thank you very much. Have a fantastic uh, success in your job and we wish thank you well. You. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to chat with you. <laughs>